to The Fine Line, a podcast which hopes to show that what divides us is actually something that truly binds us. I'm your host, Stephen Vargas, who will accompany you on this journey of discovering the fine line between the truth you're searching for may not be the truth you're looking for. Welcome to the second episode of The Fine Line. We hope you enjoyed our first episode and thanks for coming back for seconds. We hope to lighten the topic a bit from week from last week's tone, but next week will be more of the same. We feel it best to alternate from heavy topics to some lighter fare. Although after last week, you'll see the term lighter is definitely subjective. Oh, and by the way, many of the topics we discuss are on the blog, thelazygeeks.com. So feel free to check them out. Now, on with the show. But this one's coming from Disney CEO Bob Iger in a new interview with The Hollywood Reporter. During their extended interview, Iger talked a lot about Disney and where it's going in the future and areas that they could improve upon and how he sees some of their franchises like Marvel and Star Wars going in the future. With regards to Star Wars specifically, he addressed the fact that Solo underperformed and maybe there is an issue with how Disney is handling Star Wars. He said, quote, I I made the timing decision and as I look back, I think the mistake that I made, I take the blame, was a little too much too fast. You can expect some slowdown, but that doesn't mean we're not going to be making films. I think we're going to be going a little bit more careful about volume and timing. Currently what we know is that J.J. Abrams is working on the final installment of this current sequel trilogy, Episode 9. We also have Game of Thrones creators Benioff and Weiss working on a new saga of Star Wars films along with Ryan Johnson working on a separate standalone trilogy of films, and we also know that there are some spin-offs in the back burner like Boba Fett, Obi-Wan, Yoda, Jabba the Hutt, etc. But there's also some stuff that we haven't really seen much of yet, and that's like the Star Wars live action show from Jon Favreau, and you know, some more animated series and you know, other things like that. But I think the the fact that Iger is specifically focusing on the actual volume and timing of the the releases, you know, because that was a big point of contention was that The Last Jedi came out in December of 2017 and Solo came out in May this year. So people thought that maybe five to six months between Star Wars films was just too much and they should have pushed it to December to give it that annual release date. But it looks like Iger is saying that not even annually are these movies going to be coming out now. Maybe they'll actually be pushing every other year or every three years like it used to be, which would be pretty interesting, but I'm not sure he actually actually understands the real issue that's happening with Star Wars, or I guess one of the bigger issues among several things, which is the fact that, frankly, the new films that Disney is putting out are far too similar with each other and they're not really exploring the potential of what the franchise could be. When you look at the four films that Disney has produced, they've done Force Awakens, The Last Jedi, Rogue One, and Solo, and all of them feel very, very similar. They're all taking things that we knew or, you know, kind of knew and tweaking them very slightly, some of them nostalgia driven like Rogue One and Solo, especially Force Awakens because that was kind of a return to form after so many years, Disney's first film obviously, they kind of had to play it safe with that one, but after that I think a lot of people were expecting something drastically different, you know, exploring different genres, different scales to these films, you know, they could do a small scale thing here and there, but instead they did something like The Last Jedi which was kind of trying to uh, dissect or, you know, kind of break down what is Star Wars and subvert expectations and, you know, things like that, but that didn't ultimately pan out overall with the audience. It has been a summer of discontent at Disney. Their Marvel division has found that there is no limit to the amount of money they can make. With Black Panther and Avengers Affinity War, Disney made some huge gains. Of course, the same cannot be said for the Lucasfilm division. With the overly sensitive backlash from Star Wars The Last Jedi and the underperforming Solo, Disney has to rethink their yearly Star Wars deadlines. After Solo's less-than-stellar box office totals, it was not a failure like the haters want you to believe. However, Solo managed to pull into the top 10 highest-grossing movies of the summer, pulling in a $392 million worldwide gross. Disney is not furious about the box office take, but you can tell they are not pleased with it. It is also fair to keep in mind that Star Wars never really tracked well in China. In an interview with The Hollywood Reporter, 
Disney chief Bob Iger has promised that we will probably notice a change in the upcoming Star Wars release schedule. Currently, there was a plan to release a new main trilogy story every other year, and in between those years, they will have a standalone movie, so fans could have that Marvel-esque type of experience with the galaxy far, far away. I made a timing decision. As I look back, I think the mistake that I made, I take the blame, was a little too much too fast, Iger told the publication. You can expect some slowdown, but that doesn't mean we're not going to make films. J.J. is busy making nine. We have creative entities, including Game of Thrones creator David Benioff and D.B. Weiss, who are developing sagas of their own, which we haven't been specific about. And we are just at the point where we're going to start making decisions about what comes after J- next what comes next after JJ's. But I think we're going to be a bit more careful about volume and timing, and the buck stops here on that. It makes a great deal of sense, and this is what we figured from the onset. Surely after the dismal box office receipts from Solo, many sites couldn't wait to kill the Star Wars franchise. Many were still butthurt over their opinions of The Last Jedi, which are still unfounded as fans complained that The Force Awakens was a rehash of A New Hope. They wanted something different. They got it. Now they're angry that it wasn't what they had envisioned. Sites began floating rumors that Disney was shutting down all the standalones solely based on the second film. They quickly forgot the success of Rogue One two years earlier, and we reported about how that was an asinine speculation and a story solely for clicks. Of course... That is the sole motive in the age of the internet. While some sites like to promote that the quote-unquote fan backlash was right, it's not so easy to claim. There are many reasons why the films failed to generate. Like many prequels, no one asked for a solo prequel. No one really cared about where he came from, not to mention someone other than Harrison Ford playing the character. The online public turmoil on the set didn't help the marketing campaign. Even for heavy Star Wars fans, the concept of a sequel, a prequel Han Solo movie wasn't inspiring confidence. And I don't think the breathing room was a factor at all. Because lest we forget that there was a three-month window between Black Panther and Avengers Infinity War. Both films managed to strike astronomical box office numbers. Black Panther was still in many theaters when Infinity War was released. However, people that were pissed about the whole Last Jedi release wanted Solo to fail. That was the traditional online pettiness that was strung together to make a story. The original trilogy and prequels were based on a three-year timetable. This allowed stories to be written, casting to be made, edits to be done, effects to be achieved. If you are doing a series of Star Wars movies to come out every year or every other year, you need someone to head it. Think Lord of the Rings. Peter Jackson helmed all three movies and filmed them together. Now, if you want that kind of timetable, you need three scripts done before you start it. Unfortunately, three different directors were tasked for an installment. None of the directors had time to fully complete the story. What Disney found out the hard way is that not every production company is like Marvel. Their cinematic universe is like no other. Marvel's original philosophy was work on one film. Once it was completed, move on to the next one. That was their set idea. After they found the formula that worked, it was easy to begin expanding production to multiple movies at one time. However, their success was way before Disney got involved. Disney didn't purchase Marvel until the release of the original Avengers. They only got that Disney money at Phase 2. Unfortunately, Star Wars has a wealth of possibilities, but none of them are established. Basing an environment on older stories featuring younger versions of characters won't do it. Disney is finally understanding that you need to slow down, decide what to make, and move forward slowly. A yearly schedule isn't going to work unless you have a sound starting point with an overall arc. The backlash had nothing to do with it. It's called growing pains. Everyone experiences them, including uptight fans that can't evolve. Speaking of which, what's on Alex Jones's mind? 
Bilderberg is heavily involved in the EU plan and helped hatch it, and it is a Nazi plan. They had Lockheed so, scandals, just like the big lobbying scandals right now in the 70s, and that's why the SS officer, Prince Bernhard, the founder, had to step down. So, it is the ultimate lobbying meeting while you guys have this huge scandal going on. Your prime minister's going there. Okay. Uh, uh, Balls was just here, Bilderberg group member. We have forced them from cover to admit that there are puppeteers above the okay. major Let parties. David so now we and know how, how now we know that Bilderberg has given us the euro. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, if you talk to Alex for any length of time, you discover all kinds of things that you didn't know about the world. We've blown it wide open. Um, you have. You have absolutely blown it wide open. But it leaves me with a huge question for you, Alex. And it's really, you have uncovered the new world order, which is deadly. It's full of what I you call people exist. who are crim criminals. Well, this is what I'm coming to. It's full of criminals, etc., who seek to run the world and will kill anybody who gets in their way. And you are almost, or have been, a lone crusader powering against them. No, that's so, not, how come? How, am I alive? How, how are you still alive? Why am I alive? Well, no, which, is the yeah. listen, Why listen, am I which is the explanation? One, they don't exist. Or two, you're part of the conspiracy. No, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story. I uh, say the first. Five years ago when Obama and Hillary... I say the second. Five years I ago when Hillary and Obama were at Bilderberg and the Secret Service was there in helicopters, the New York Times came out and said I was crazy. There was no Bilderberg group meeting. And my wife got phone calls, and so did I, threatening to kill us. And the people said, and you better take it serious because you were just talking to your dad that was in the hospital. But, you better shut your mouth or we're going to cut your head off. But now, if that, they, no, if that's they the... they were going to kill that, you, they, they listened to, they wouldn't they listen to everybody's the phone lines. They call up and harass people that expose them well, and they, tell them and tell so, them so what they were just talking about they, the they are, Alex, they you're going to say there's no spying. Alex, I'm it's here. like Nazi hold Germany. On, hold the on. only spy on the bad guys, hold huh? You let, you let him speak now. Well, sir, no, Alex, I Alex, saw one of your ministers say this, though. No, Alex, Alex I'm here. I'm, tyranny. No, shut up. I, I'm, 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 here, I, I'm here to testify that your head was not cut off. Ladies well, and gentlemen, are you sure if about they kill me, it turns me into a martyr. It, it, it puts big exclamation points on the end of what I've said, and I have put out a lot of information. There's millions of others that are exposing it. And the look, we have mega banks that are getting $85 billion a month of U.S. taxpayer money. Most of it goes to Europe and England. Uh, British taxpayers, EU taxpayers have to pay to these mega bankers. They're right. in there setting this up. It's come out. And then the media yeah. distracts you with, All oh, right. look at a guy that okay. talked to a lobbyist right. when the real lobbyist okay, is going listen, on. Listen, you're not going to dominate this. He gets to speak to. It's not your own radio show. Uh, should we be worried about Builder Group at all? It's a kind of, it's mildly interesting, the Bilderberg Group, and it feels, doesn't it, when you were talking about it in the film, slightly kind of out of date as belonging yeah. to the era when oh, the you Cold couldn't, War. yeah, when you couldn't even admit in Parliament that there was a, you know, when we called the head of MI5M or whatever it was we called them, we couldn't admit to these things. Yeah. And so to the extent that it seems people aren't archaic, ready to be spied on yet. Uh, 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 what was that a fact? People anyway. haven't been acclimated yet. Did you let him finish? We're in a right. police state. It's 1984. Yeah, listen, well, you guys just want to normalize you, it. Would you let him Alex, finish? Alex, how come you're here? Yeah. If we're in a police state, how yeah. come they, they actually turned back some of my reporters, but they didn't turn me back, and I was told this think, because they don't want to make a stink. Do you think the BBC is part of the Bilderberg Group? Well, uh, you know, Winston Smith did work here. I mean, come on, Eric Blair worked here, and that's what he said it was. Why do you think we've George let you Arwell. on? Why have we let you on then? Because you guys think that you can manage the whole thing, and now our information's gotten too big. I have three million radio listeners a day. That's a low number. Three million. I get about 50 million YouTube uh, views a month. That's a very conservative number. I make films, put them online for free, that get watched 40 okay. million times, like the Obama deception. All and right. that's why, because the establishment All doesn't right. know what to do. Now, to speak. Now, Alex, now, Alex has this point, and it's, a, and it's an important one. I would have, say, 10 years ago said, Listen to all this stuff. He believes that people put cancer virus in vaccine in order in order to create a eugenics program. That's what he that's yeah. what he believes. We talk it's, about it's like medical that. discoveries. And, and we would have said, and we would and I would have said, hey, that's kind of mad and so on. And it's an interesting psychological phenomenon. Like dismiss the, Skiggy, it. the, prob syllabus, the problem is the conspiracy theories like this Oi, are believed. I believed in Hey, what, listen, what? I'm here to warn people. You keep telling me to shut up. This isn't a game. Okay, our government in the U.S. is building FEMA camps. We have an NDAA where they disappear people now. You have this arrest for public safety, life in prison. You are the worst person I've ever interviewed. No, no, it's basically off it. with their heads, disappear David, them, thank take you them for away. being with us. InfoWars.com, Liberty past 11. is rising. You're watching the Liberty Sunday Politics. Rising. We have an idiot Freedom in the program today. Stop.
You coming will not up stop in just freedom. 20 minutes. You will not stop the republic. Humanity is awakening. Infowars.com. No, you guys are crazy. I'll be looking at the week the ahead with our political stupid. panel. You're Until crazy. then, the Think Sunday the politics across the You're UK. Crazy. Our focus this week is the internet. That hotbed of amazing historical facts and Photoshop pictures of Emma Watson in a three-way. That ain't going to happen. As much as we would wish it to, it ain't going to happen. There are a few things I want to cover about the internet. Its benefits, the need for it, and the harm of being connected 24-7. So first off, the benefits. The natural benefit is to ease, is the ease of access to porn. First, at first, you used to have to go into your bedroom in, in the dark, masturbate like a fiend, hoping that you would get off before you got caught. Whether it be to a porno mag, a porn tape with the volume nearly all the way down. And if you were a kid, you were hoping that boob would pop in crystal clear on those cra- scrambled cable channels. If you don't know what I'm talking about, ask your parents, kids. With that benefit a given, I will move on to the other instances like freedom of information. No other time since the invention of the printing press has information been readily available at any moment. How impeachment works? How Clinton be- would Clinton become president if Trump was impeached? Short answer is no. What did President Trump say today? And in what, in what year was the War of 1812 fought in? The ease of call to action, whether in the political, religious, or even philanthropic realm, you can gather support to give money for a noble cause or bring attention to something going on in your community, helping people out with access to food, support, or even possibly getting money from some person in Kenya. The invention of services like Facebook, Skype, or Snapchat, allowing people to connect with one another over great distances before even when a, pers- when a person moved, there was a greater chance that you would never see that person again. Now, With these social media applications, you can keep in touch with them 24-7 and be embarrassed when you've bumped into one another on Tinder. It was an it's an open to a wide avenue of starting a business online, producing content, being able to create online series, comics, or podcasts that will allow the creation of a global community, allowing any individual a great soapbox to stand on and spread their message. Write a blog that could inspire millions around the world. Or start a Patreon to show off not so notable, suitable for work uh, pictures of P- Princess Peach doing something to Mario that you would need to pay a monthly subscription to see. The benefit of the internet are too numerous and vast to fit into a 30-minute podcast. However, it has allowed people to share commonalities and passions, no longer committing some people to loneliness for having an alternate interest, whether you live in a red state as a homosexual or unsure what your sexual identity is, you have someone that can help you from miles away. That is the benefits of the internet. Now, the need for it. Now, there are some countries that still don't have access to the internet. They can barely receive educational functionality of the internet, while we in the United States have to jockey for the best arrow meme on me for Meme Monday. This is a genera- there is a generation right now that has never known a world without the internet. However, there are countries in the world that don't know why anyone would take a picture of their food. There are still places in the world that don't have internet as part of their daily lives. Think call centers, and you wouldn't necessarily associate the industry with Kenya, but it is one of the country's fastest growing businesses. Welcome to Orange, my name is Mary. This is one of the largest companies. Ken Call employs around 350 people or Orange, that's Telcom Kenya. Its clients include Orange and TalkTalk. The company wouldn't exist without this, a submarine fiber optic cable which was laid down off East Africa in 2009, linking Kenya to the United Arab Emirates. It has enabled us to play at the level that our competitive countries play at in Mauritius, South Africa, India, Philippines and so on. They're all on fiber. Historically, when we started Ken Call, we were on satellite. That was a real hindrance. People were not willing to look at us. Now, with fiber, they are. The fiber optic cable has also brought down the cost of telecommunications, allowing 15 million Kenyans to access the internet on their phones, 
and encouraging new technology like this. Mobile money transferring systems like M-Pesa have transformed the lives of millions of Kenyans. You can buy a coffee with M-Pesa, you can pay off your utility bills. Kenyans now feel far more comfortable with using their mobiles as an internet tool. But only a third of Kenyans have access to high-speed internet. The government admits it needs to expand its underground network of fiber optic cables to rural areas. We want to get into the last mile. Uh, this is what is lacking. And I'm sure once we hit it, uh, the last mile, uh, the, we would move from where we are to actually where most uh, advanced countries are in terms of usage. Around a million Kenyans are on Facebook. Kenyans are also Africa's most active users of Twitter after South Africa. Economists at the World Bank say Kenya is moving from a digital divide to a digital tide. Nazani Mashiri, Al Jazeera, Nairobi. That was an Al Jazeera report. While we are photoshopping pictures of Emma Watson in a three-way, there are still countries that are barely getting to pay their bills online or ordering with Uber Eats. During the Arab Spring, the internet was shut down by totalitarian regimes that were preventing insurgents from communicating. The free flow of information is supported by many Western nations, although some might not want it that way. The need for the Internet is important in areas that do not have access up to information. The Internet was conceived to initiate a debate of ideals and fundamental rights for everyone. The Internet is needed to call attention to atrocities or disasters that many people would not even know about. It could give ac us access to war crimes natural disasters, or human suffering in a scope that no one can ever imagine. Even though some countries have internet, not much and much of it is filtered due to the tyrannical governments hoping to stymie any revolution that would appear in their country. Even to this day, countries like Japan reduce the amount of information its people learn from, atrocities, from their atrocities in World War II. Many of their people learn that information not from school, but from the information they get off the internet. China itself has its own firewall, and if Western countries want to do business with China, they have to curb their standards. So much for free flow of information. Now, many governments around the world, even ours, try to suppress freedom of information as a way to curb free thinking, suppress knowledge. People will not know a better way of life. Obtaining information that could improve the quality of life, or see porn for free, now, I believe if all countries had free, unfettered access to porn, the world would be a better place. Now, that brings us to the negative impacts of the Internet. To all the benefits of the Internet we spoke about, there are some, the same, if not more, drawbacks to the free flow of information. As of right now, countries are starting to pull the reins on what information and content is getting out there. Exorbitant amount of partisan exaggeration, hate speech, and conspiracy theories are flowing like an open faucet. We are now just starting to try to slow that information after 20 plus years of unsupervised freedom. That is the equivalent of, you know, throwing a group of 100 people or so together, leaving them to their own devices, suddenly finding out that they appointed themselves a leader and led them to a small South American country where they all committed suicide because one psychotic fuckwad got them to drink flavor aid. That was Jonestown, you fucking idiot. Know your history. Read a book, for Christ's sakes. Now, with the ease of access to a wide range of information, we are the most ignorant of facts. With the rise of partisan politics, beliefs, and fake news, it's hard to deem what is real and what isn't. And I'm not talking about who had the better diss track, Eminem or some other rapper I couldn't give a shit about. I'm talking about conspiracy theories that are being passed around partisan sites as if they were fact. We discuss some of this in our first episode. At the same time, we've reached new lows in misogyny and racist trolls calling out actors in Hollywood. Star Wars actress Mary Kelly Tran was ridiculed by racist rants on social media for being cast in a Star Wars movie. Daisy Ridley was run off social media for simply being the female lead in the same set of films. Angry white extremists and trolls using them as social justice warriors run amok and ruining their franchise. Ruining their white franchise. Keep in mind, no one made fun of Samuel L. Jackson in the prequels. Why? Because he would pull a Jules speech from Pulp Fiction, and no one wants that. Now, at the same time, 
Actress Ruby Rose was cast as Batwoman in the upcoming Arrowverse crossover event. She left Twitter due to the backlash from both sides. One group not understanding why a gay actress had to play the part, even though the character is, in fact, gay. And not only that, but received torment from the LGBTQ community for not being gay enough. Suicides among teenagers are on the rise due to social media bullying. You have outdated notions of adults claiming that liberal parents aren't preparing their children for the rigors of the real world. The sad fact, when many of them were in school, when they left for the day, the bullying stopped. I was bullied in high school. I was being harassed in my freshman year by a bigger kid, and at one point, they would phone my house and hang up call with hang-up calls. Nowadays, kids are exposed to it with social media. Kids create fake accounts and send nasty messages, memes, and even tell one another to kill themselves. On that side, it is difficult for parents to understand this because they are not accustomed to this kind of bullying. Not to mention anyone over the age of 45 that didn't adopt early don't understand how social media works, much less how it could be perverted into a bully's wet dream. And for adults, the issue has become being glued to their phones, shifting between Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Tinder, or whatever app you're into. Pay attention to what everyone is doing, as opposed to seeing what's going on in your life. Basing your self worth on how other people are on how other people are doing, seeing your friends going on these weekend excursions, fanciful trips to exotic locales, you see this and wonder how they can afford a trip. Um, when a, for you, a trip to the ninety nine cent store is a hit to your bank account. These technologies, especially those that are developed by the really large companies that have the resources to do this type of engineering, so like Twitter and Facebook, uh, these technologies are engineered to be addictive because that's how the attention economy works. The more time you spend looking at your Twitter feed or looking at your Facebook wall, the more those companies can monetize the cognitive landscape between your ears. It's that doing actual hard thinking, the actual hard thinking it takes to learn a new skill, the actual hard thinking it takes to apply that skill at a high level. This is by definition a boring activity in the sense that there's not a lot of novelty. So that type of addiction that a lot of people are forming can have this big negative impact on actual their professional development and their professional success. So basically, we're being exploited by these big tech companies through our use of all these apps and devices, which ultimately discourage hard thinking and learning. It's a pretty bleak prospect, but to what extent, if any, is this really a problem? To better understand American usage habits, I spoke with Craig Wigington, who oversees Deloitte's Global Mobile Consumer Survey. We found this year that Americans in the aggregate check their cell phone or mobile device over 9 billion times a day. Over 9 billion times a day. This time, which is interesting, the younger generation that we have in our survey, which is 18 to 24, was not the highest usage generation. It was actually the next one up, the 25 to 34 year olds. So these guys, mid 20 to early 30 somethings. You know about the 30 something game. Not these guys, teens to early 20 somethings. The most unusual finding was a question we asked about, do you check your device in the middle of the night? And the response was a lot higher than I expected. 50%, almost 50% of all consumers check their phone in the middle of the night. And in the 25 to 34 year old category, it's more than 70% check their device in the middle of the night. So according to the Deloitte survey, my generation is the worst offender. Does all this usage come at a cost? One of the things we're seeing both clinically as well as research is these technologies are changing the way we deal with our emotions. Researchers are actually starting to look at fear of missing out, FOMO. One of the things that happens is what we call envy-inducing experiences. You're on social media, you see something from someone else, it makes you feel envious, like they are having a better experience or living a life or doing something that you wish you could do. Active social media use is actually related to positive outcomes. So it's it all comes down to the function, the ability to have instant connection with people, gather information, uh, get work information, get school information, get entertainment in your pocket at all times is radically new. 
We've never had anything like that before. It is a grand experiment that we're running. While some countries are looking to gain access to the internet, which the United Nations deemed as a basic human right, some of us in this country need to get back to basics. Stop looking at things in a swipe right fashion. Develop a longer attention span. We need to find that personal connection again. Look at opposite points of view to get a grasp of on hot button topics. Engage in basic human contact. Learn that our online personas are not acceptable in the real world. It isn't too late to find the balance for our dependency to technology. It's, real, it's really never too late for anything. It really isn't. But don't take it from me. Take it from this infer- inspirational message from Simon Sinek. There should be no cell phones in conference rooms. None. Zero. And I don't mean the kind of like sitting outside waiting to text. I mean like when you're sitting and waiting for a meeting to start, nobody go, this is what we all do. We all sit here and wait for the meeting to start. Meeting starting? Okay. And we start the meeting. No. That's not how relationships are formed. Remember we talked about it's the little things? Relationships are formed this way. We're waiting for a meeting to start and we go, how's your dad? I heard he was in the hospital. Oh, he's really good. Thanks for asking. He's actually at home now. Oh, I'm really glad. That was really amazing. I know. It was really scary for a while. That's how you form relationships. Hey, did you ever get that report done? Oh, my God. No, I didn't. I'll help you out. I totally, I'll, can I help you out with that? Really? That's how trust forms. Trust doesn't form at an event, in a day. Even bad times don't form trust immediately. It's the slow, steady consistency. And we have to create mechanisms where we allow for those little innocuous interactions to happen. But when we allow cell phones in conference rooms, we just, okay, have the meeting. And then my favorite is like when there's a cell phone there and you go like this, you go. (laughs) It rings and you go. I'm not going to answer that. Mr. Magnanimous, you know? (laughs) When you're out for dinner with your friends, like, uh, I I do this with my friends. When we're going out for dinner and we're leaving together, we'll we'll leave our cell phones at home. Who are we calling? Maybe one of us will bring a phone in case we need to call an Uber or take a picture of our meal. Uh, (laughs) That's what I was saying. Come on. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not... I'm, I'm an idealist, but I'm not insane. You know? <laughs> not a heathen. I mean, it looked really good. Um, we'll take one phone. And so it's like an alcoholic. The reason you take the alcohol out of the house is, be- we, is because we cannot trust our willpower. We're just not strong enough. But when you remove the temptation, it actually makes it a lot easier. And so when you just say, don't check your phone, people literally will go like this. And somebody will go to the bathroom, and what's the first thing we do? Because <laughs> I wouldn't want to look around the restaurant for a minute and a half, you know? But if you don't have the phone, you just kind of enjoy the world. And that's where ideas happen. The constant, constant, constant engagement is not where you have innovation and ideas. Ideas happen when our minds wander, and we go, and you see something, uh, I bet they could do that. That's called innovation. Right? But we're taking away all those little moments. Right? You should not, and none of us, none of us should charge our phones by our beds. We should be charging our phones in the living rooms. Right? Remove the temptation. You wake up in the middle of the night because you can't sleep, you won't check your phone, which makes it worse. But if it's in the living room, it's relaxed, it's fine. I, I, uh, but it's my alarm clock. Buy an alarm clock. <laughs> <laughs> they cost $8. I'll, right? <laughs> I'll buy you an alarm clock. Right? But the point, is, the point is, is we now, in industry, whether we like it or not, we don't get a choice. We now have a responsibility to make up the shortfall and to help this amazing, idealistic, fantastic generation build their confidence, learn patience, learn the social skills, find a better balance between life and technology. Because, quite frankly, it's, it's the right thing to do. And now this, another entry on why do we have morning news shows? A sticky situation at an airport in Tennessee after baggage was sprayed with raw sewage. Sprayed? I know. Check it out. Happened at the National Airport. Well, this is the airport. Okay. Picture it, if you will. Water and sewage from a clogged toilet leaked to the floor onto a conveyor (laughs) carrying passenger luggage. Henry's been in here again. The airport says the tainted baggage was sanitized before being loaded onto planes and the passengers were not exposed. How do you sanitize it? Exactly. Just hose it off. Apparently, this is the second time it's happened at the Nashville airport. Some travelers say they just couldn't believe it.
Oh no, I'd be. Oh, there, there'd be some backlash on that. I mean, accidents happen, but that's a big accident. Oh, that's disgusting. I would never want that to happen to my bags. Said it happened twice. Henry, you flew into Nashville a couple of times. <laughs> Southwest, the airline affected by the leak says they're going to replace some of the more soiled bags. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of you who just have a little soil, you're on your own. Uh, the 10 flights were delayed. The airport is promising to change the layout of the bathroom so it never happens again. Well, soil is one of those words. There's yeah. just no way to say it. It just no. uh, sounds like uh, yeah. chunky moisture. Oh, <laughs> it's just it's the two. Ah. It's the two words. Yeah, you hate. Yeah. yeah. Corn. No. How'd that get on my bag? Okay, too far. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Here's the deal. Here's the deal. Just wait, wait, wait. This just it. We're on TV. We're on TV. <laughs> There are people watching. We're not in a private area. Just FYI. Oh my gosh. All right. Honey, is that a spare? No, no, no. All right. I'm going to do this, and it's going to be great. All new on the KTLA News at 5. And finally, the internet is an amazing thing. It can bring people together over great distances, which we would never have contact, reconnect with people, make new friends, send memes to, hot cosplay pictures, and epic animal vids. But in my case, share hot Instagram pictures with Adam. It has some amazing benefits as well as some major drawbacks. We have to learn to not take things at face value. Fake news and partisan propaganda is all over. Slant, passing off as news, are running rampant, misleading headlines to gain clicks, otherwise known as clickbait, misogynistic and racial comments litter your Twitter feed, this is difficult to under, it is difficult to understand why we even deal with this behavior. Much of it is our reliance on social media platforms to do the work for us. They need to monitor their content and remove things we find objectionable. The major problem with that is revenue. During the social media debate after the 2016 election, Congress failed to see how the spread of fake news proliferated on the internet because they paid for it. The idea that you would need more than a credit card to promote your story, site, or blog. Think about how easy it is to take out an ad in the newspaper. Why would it be any harder to do that on the internet? We, as a people, need to read these stories and deem for ourselves what is fiction and what is fact. Like the story of the slowdown of Star Wars. There is no fact supporting fan theories, but it doesn't. they don't need it. Theories are enough for most people to accept as it supports their view. This is what the internet has become, a microcosm of fragmented words and phrases manipulated to make their own conclusions. It is up to us not to believe every story we read online, expecting someone else to filter it for us. It wouldn't be on the internet if it wasn't true, right? The essence of wisdom is to listen to all points of view and come up with your own conclusion. That is usually what makes a great leader. Someone that only listens to the outlets that reinforce their point of view is doomed to failure. As I said earlier, in an era of immense information, we are the most blinded. Before, you would read news from a few sources and choose what sh to believe what you wish. Now, you can only go to those sites that feed on your interests. That doesn't lead a nation of wise people. It leads to a nation waiting to fall into anarchy. Our culture is please-based. If I say something unpopular, I will lose followers, fans, or likes. If I speak my mind, it shows people that I do not follow the herd. The problem with that fact is if you have no facts to back up your own side, you are following the herd. Reciting the talking points of a subject does not produce results. Arguing the facts will throw the other person off their game. Simply because someone shared it on Facebook or Twitter doesn't make it gospel. People will scrutinize bread recipe details on Pinterest than they would a story on Facebook. In the age of the internet, we have gotten so lazy that we scream over headlines. No one ever follows the link through to see the actual story, which is normally clickbait. Anyway, put down the devices, unplug, log out, take time away from the devices, and look around you. Talk to people and have an actual conversation. While the internet brings us together for amazing good, it can be perverted into a message board of hate, racism, misogyny, anti-Semitism. Sometimes when you look around, it, doesn't, it does spark a thought of, do we really need all this information? 
But, I mean, we can look at the bright side, though. It makes porn easier to get at. And that is our show. We want your reviews. If you're listening on iTunes or Apple Podcast app, we want those five-star reviews. You can review us on Stitcher or anywhere you get the show or drop by the blog, thelazygeeks.com. While you're there, drop us a donation. We're accepting donations on the website to help keep this podcast and all the other shows on the Lazy Geeks Network running. Any donations will help keep the shows coming. Pay our hosting costs, update our equipment. All you need to do is go to lazygeeks.com and look for the donate button. Click on it and it will take you to to PayPal to donate. Any amount will be helpful and appreciated. Following this show, follow the show. <laughs> follow this show and all the others on the Lazy Geeks Network. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at the Lazy Geeks, one word. Drop us a line for future topics on or suggestions to the fine line at the lazygeeks.com. God, I'm reading everything all wrong today. I feel like I had a stroke or something. Check out some of the other podcasts on the Lazy Geeks Network over at thelazygeeks.com. Our flagship podcast, The Lazy Geeks, arrives every Monday while our cinephile podcast, the extended play movie podcast, comes to you every Tuesday. You can follow me on Twitter at a middle age geek and Instagram middle age underscore geek. That is us for this week. So until next time, and hopefully without a stroke, uh, when searching for the truth, keep an open mind because the truth will set you free. Mm-hmm.